Question 1a, solve 4n greater than 11n plus 6. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to first of all take away 11n from both sides. So I'm basically isolating the n's on the left and the constants, the numbers on the right. So in order to do that, I'm taking 11n away from both sides. And plus my 6. Uh, 14n take away 11n is leaving me with 3n. Greater than 11n take away 11n are gone. And that's leaving me with 6. Then I'm dividing both sides by 3. And 3n divided by 3 is 1n. And 6 divided by 3 is 2. So n is greater than 2. Question 1b, on the number line below, show the set of values for minus 2 less than x plus 3 less than or equal to 4. So how I'm going to do this is I'm going to break it up into two parts. The first part I'm going to look at is this inequality here, minus 2 less than x plus 3. And then I'm going to look at a second inequality and I'm looking at the second part, which is going to be x plus 3 less than or equal to positive 4. So if I look at the one in green first of all, so I have minus 2 less than x plus 3. So what I'm going to do there first of all is I'm going to take away 3 from both sides because once again I want to isolate the x's on one side and the constants on the other. So taking 3 away from both sides and that's going to leave me with x plus 3 minus 3. That minus 3 and plus 3 will cancel. Minus 2, take away 3 on the left hand side, leaves me with negative 5, less than x. So that's my first value. Coming over to the one in blue, x plus 3 less than or equal to 4. All I'm going to do here is I'm going to take away 3 from both sides. So x plus 3, subtract the 3. And because I did that to the left, I must also do it to the right. So 4, take away 3. Plus 3, take away 3, will cancel. That's leaving me with x less than or equal to positive 1. Now, I need to graph that on the number line, so I'm drawing the real numbers. So x less than or equal to 1, that's going to be a solid dot. Uh, and that's going to negative 5, and it's less than negative 5, so... Uh, or negative 5 is less than x, so that's going to be an open circle, because it's not equal to. And then I'm going to connect the two of them together by drawing a solid line between the two. So just make sure that you have the solid dot for the equal to part and an open circle for the less than part. That's question one. Question two on the grid below, draw the graph of y is equal to 2x minus 3 for the values x from minus 2 to positive 4. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is first of all I'm going to draw out a little table here to help me out. And I'm going to have my x values in my table and my x values are going to be uh, negative 2 up to 4. So negative 2, negative 1, uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 and positive 4. Then I'm going to get my corresponding y values. So what I'm doing here basically is I'm subbing minus 2 into the equation here of the line. y is equal to 2x minus 3. So if I sub it in, so for the first one it's going to look something like 2 bracket, sub in the minus 2 for my y value, and then I'm going to take 3 away from that. So 2 multiplied by minus 2 is minus 4, take away 3 is minus 7. Uh, if I come to the minus 1, it'll look something like 2 bracket subbing in 0, or sorry, subbing in minus 1, uh, and then I'm going to take away 3 from that. So that's giving me minus 2, take away 3 is negative 5. So if I work through all of those, uh, for the next one, I get two zeros. Take away three is giving me negative three. Uh, if I sub in one, again, I'll do another one here. It's two bracket one, take away three, which is two, take away three, which is uh, negative one. The next one would be two multiplied by two, which is four, take away three, which is positive one. Uh, subbing in three, two trees are six, take away three is three. And I'll do the last one. It's two bracket four, take away three, two fours are eight, take away three is 5. So there are my corresponding y values. If I then write down my points, I have my first point, which will be my x followed by my y, x followed by my y, uh, 0 minus 3, 1 minus 1, 2, 1, 3, 3, and 4, 5. So there are my points. And on the grid now, I'm going to plot those points. 
So plotting them x first, so I'm going back to minus 2, down to minus 7 for my first point. So that's bringing me all the way down to the bottom left here. So that's my first point that I'm going to plot. Then I'm plotting minus 1, minus 5, so go left to minus 1, down to negative 5, so my second point will be here. Then I'm going 0, so I'm staying put, but I'm going down to minus 3 on the y. Uh, 1 minus 1, so I'm staying on 1 on the x, down to negative 1 on the y, so that's there. Then I'm going 2 up to 1. I'm going to 3, 3, so across the 3 on the x, up to 3 on the y. And my final point is across the 4 on the x and up to 5 on the y. So there are my points plotted. Now I just need to connect them with my ruler now. And that's it. So that is question 2. Scrolling down now to question three. So question three says, Hannah is play, planning a day trip for 195 students. She asked a sample of 30 students where they want to go. Each student chooses one place. The table shows information about her results. Okay, so part one says, work out how many of the 195 students you think will want to go to the theme park. So first of all here, I'm going to look at the fraction of the sample that want to go to the theme park. Well, 10 of my sample want to go to the theme park, and that's out of 30 students, which simplifies to 1 over 3, doesn't it? If I divide top and bottom of the fraction by uh, 10. So a third of the students of my sample want to go to the theme park. So basically what I want to do is I want to find one third of 195 students, the total amount of students. So I'm basically going to go 195 multiplied by 1 over 3. So a third of 195 is 65 students. So I'm estimating that 65 students want to go to the theme park. Part two then is saying state any assumption you made and explain how this may affect your answer. So what sort of assumption are we making? Well, the assumption I'm making is that my sample is random. So that's the first thing I'm going to say. I'm going to assume that the sample that I picked is a random sample. So that's the first thing. And I'm also going to say that the sample is representative of the entire population or the entire 195 students. So I'm saying the sample of 30 students um, is representative of the entire population. Now when I say population, I mean the 195 students uh, in the class group. Uh, so that is question three. Looking now at question four. So question four has a container in the shape of a cuboid. The container is two thirds full of water and then we have a cup holds 275 milliliters of water. What's the greatest number of cups that can be completely filled with water from the container? Well, first of all, if the container has been filled to two thirds, we need to find the volume of that container and then find out what two thirds of that is. So the volume of a cuboid is going to be length multiplied by width multiplied by height. So that's the volume of our cuboid, which is giving us a length of 30 multiplied by a width of 6 multiplied by a height of 19. So that's giving me a volume then for the cuboid of 3,420 centimeters cubed because the question has given us uh, centimeters of length. Now we know that one centimeter cubed is the same as one milliliter of water or liquid. So in other words, the volume of this cuboid is 3,420 milliliters. Now, the question tells us that the cuboid is not fully full, it's only two thirds full. So we want to find two thirds of uh, 3,420. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to divide 3,420 by 3 and multiply by 2. Or go to your calculator and go 3,420 multiplied by 2 over 3. And that's giving me 2,280 milliliters. And that is the volume of water bringing up this shape to about two thirds full. Now the next part of that question is telling us that we now have a cup. And in this cup we have uh, 275 milliliters in it. We want to basically find out 
how many cups I can make if I keep pouring the water from the container into cups. So what I'm going to do there is I'm going to take the volume of my container, which is 2,280 milliliters, and I'm going to divide that by the volume of my cup, which is 275 milliliters, and 275 goes into 2,280 8.929 times. Now, the question wants us what's the greatest number of cups, so we're going to assume they're full cups. Uh, it does actually completely filled with water, so that means that I can only fill eight cups uh, from the tank. And that is question four. Question five is our trigonometry question. ABC is a right angle triangle. Calculate the length of AB. So let's just first of all mark in AB. So what do they want us to find? They want us to find the length of that line here. So if I label my triangle, um, I'm given the angle C. So first of all, we're going to mark in our hypotenuse, hypotenuse, which is across from the 90. So this side here is my HYP, standing for hypotenuse. Then I'm going to mark in the length of the opposite. So that's opposite the angle that I'm given, which is the 38 degrees. So I'm going to call this my opposite, OPP. And then my final length is going to be my adjacent. So always fill the adjacent in last. First of all, start with the hypotenuse, then the opposite, and then the adjacent. Now, in order to solve this, we're going to use our trigonometric ratios. So sine, cos, and tan. So I have them learned as silly, old Harry, caught a herring, trawling, of America. So S stands for sine, C stands for cos, T stands for tan, O stands for opposite, H stands for hypotenuse, and A stands for adjacent. So we just have to make sure that we use a formula with uh, opposite in it because that's the one we want to find. So that could be sine or it could be tan. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to match up while I'm given the hypotenuse which is 16. Which one uses hypotenuse? Well it's cos and also sine. But you can see now that sine has two yellow highlighters, which is O and H, so I'm going to use my sine ratio. So that is sine of the angle is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And I'm given the angle, it's 38 degrees, so sine of 38 degrees is equal to opposite, which I need to find, so I'm going to call that AB, over the length of the hypotenuse, which is 16. In order to find the length of AB, I'm going to put the sine 38 over 1 and cross multiply because I now have a fraction equals to a fraction. So if I multiply across, 1 multiplied by AB will give me AB. And then I'm going to go 16 times sine of 38. So I'm running out of space, so I'm just going to come up here. So AB is equal to 16 times sine 38. So if I go to my calculator and type in 16 times sine 38, that is giving me 9.85 centimeters. And the question wants it to uh, two decimal points, which is 9.5, or sorry, 85 centimeters to two decimal points. Uh, that's question five. Question six, Sally uses her calculator to work out the value of a number Y. The answer on her calculator display began 8.3. Complete the error interval for Y. So it began with 8.3. So that means we have to start with our 8.3 here. And what can that number go to? Well, it can go, well, if you think about it, it can go all the way up to 8.39, but it could go another nine, and it can go another nine, and it can go another nine, and it can keep going on and on and on and on forever. It can go to infinity on your calculator saying 8.3, Nine 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 nine. Now we call that uh, basically it's uh, a reoccurring decimal. So that's the same as eight point three nine with a little dot. If you're using a Casio calculator, that dot is telling you that that nine goes on forever. Now if you look at the question though, it's saying less than here, so it's not including uh, a number. So what I'm going to put in there? Well, what's the first uh, number? that it can be less than 3.999 is less than, well, I could put in a um, 8.4 in there, couldn't I? So if I put in 8.4, it has to be a number which is less than 8.4. Well, that is technically 8.39 uh, recurring. Um, and that's question six. 
Question seven, 360 pounds is shared between Abby, Ben, Chloe, and Denise. So that's looking, so it's, it's ratio. So A is to B, is to C, is to D. Then tells us that the ratio for Abby to Ben is two is to seven. So that's two is to seven. It then tells me that Chloe and Denise get 1.5 times the amount that Abby get. Well, Abby gets two parts and both uh, C and D are getting one and a half times that amount. So I'm going to multiply two by one and a half, which is getting me three portions. So that then is giving me a ratio. Remember, it says that Chloe and Denise each get one and a half times Abby. So that means that they are going to be the same amount. So that's two is to seven is to three is to three. I then add those together and I get two plus seven plus three plus three is 15 portions altogether. I then divide the 360 pounds by 15 and I get 24 euro or pounds, I should say. And I then want to get Ben's amount of money. Ben is getting seven parts. So I need to multiply 24 pounds by seven and that's giving me 100 and 68 pounds. And that is question seven. Question eight, A, write 0 0.00562 in standard form. So your decimal point must fall between two numbers from one to 10. So my decimal point here is going to go between the five and the six. So it's gonna go 5.62. And I then have to look at moving my original decimal point to my new decimal point. So I'm just gonna count how many jumps that is. So I'm going one, two, three times. So that is giving me 5.62 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative three. And it's negative three because it is a extremely small number. It's a decimal number here. So that has 5.62 multiplied by 10 to the power of negative three. 8b, write 1.452 multiplied by 10 to the power of 3 is an ordinary number. So I need to um, move my decimal point three places and it's a positive three. So I'm moving it up the number line. So one, two, three. So my decimal point is going to go after the two. So that's 1,452.0. So I can put as many zeros there as I wish, but that's the same as 1,452 as my answer. You can always check these by typing them in your calculator and verifying your answer is right. That's question eight. Moving now to question nine. Question nine is stating that I have the circumference of circle B is 90% the circumference of circle A. Find the ratio of the area of circle A to the area of circle B. So everyone kind of tackles these differently. Uh, I'm going to just sketch them here first of all. So I'm going to assume that's my first circle A and circumference, so we know the formula for circumference is two pi r, and it is given in a ratio to circle B, and again, that's gonna be two pi r. But we know something about circle B. It's only 90% the size of circle A, so I'm actually gonna multiply this by 0 0.90 to make it that little bit smaller. And when I do that then, I get, uh, 2 pi r is to 2 multiplied by 0 0.90, which is 1.8 pi r. I'm going to divide both sides by pi, so they'll cancel. I'm going to divide both sides by r, they'll cancel. And that's leaving me with a ratio of 2 is to 1.8. Next thing I'm going to do is we don't like decimals and ratios. So to get rid of that decimal, I'm going to multiply both sides by 10 and that is going to give me 2 by 10 is 20, 1.8 by 10 is 18. I'm then going to divide both sides by, what can we divide? By 2, so that's going to give me 2 into 20 is 10, 2 into 18 is 9. So the ratio of circle A to circle B is 9 is to 10 when we're looking at circumference. The question though wants the ratios when we're talking area. So I just now need to do a little bit of work uh, to get the areas. Well, if I bring that up, so I have A is to B, I'm just losing space here. So that's 10 is to nine, we said. Now that's talking about length because circumference 
is talking about the length of a shape. We want area which is going to square that, isn't it? Because we want to get from a length to a square or to an area, we need to square my answers. So all I'm doing basically is squaring the left and squaring the right. Because if you do it to one side, you have to do it to the other. So 10 multiplied by 10 is 100. 9 multiplied by 9 is 81. So my ratio there is going to be 100 is to 81. Looking now at 9b. So we have a square E and a square F in this case. So let's again draw out what they're, what they're giving me. So I have a square, calling it E, and it has a length E. And I have then a square F, and it has a length F. So that's what I'm given. What else do we know? That it's talking area. So to get area, we multiply length by width or square aside because it's uh, length by width is both e by e, which is giving me a e squared, is to f squared. Now it tells us that the area of square e is 44% greater than the area of f. So what does that mean? I'm going to keep f as it is, but it's telling me that the area of E is 1.44 times bigger than F. So I'm going to change E squared to 1.44 F squared. And if we think about that, 44% is 0 0.44 as a decimal, and it's 100% is the original, but it's 44% bigger than the original. So that's why I'm going the original size plus the new increased size, which brings me to 144%, which as a decimal is 1.44. So that's why I'm multiplying F by 1.44. Uh, that F squared is the same as one F squared. And if I divide both sides by F squared, they will cancel out. So that's leaving me with 1.44 is to 1. Now that is ratios for area, so I'm just going to write in area here. But the question wants us to work out the ratio of E is to F, so that's length. So in order to go from an, uh, an area to a length, I need to get the square root. So the square root of something will turn the area into a length. So think about a square of uh, 5, 5, 5, 5. The area there is 5 by 5, which is 25. But to get back to 5, I get the square root of 25. Uh, so that's the same here. So the square root of 1.44 is uh, 1 1.2, is to the square root of 1, which is 1. Again, don't like decimals in my ratios. To get rid of that one decimal point, I'm going to multiply by 10. Must multiply both sides by 10. So 1.2 by 10 is 12. 1 multiplied by 10 is 10. Divide both sides by 2 leaves me with 6 is to 5 as my ratio of E is to F. So E is to F is 6 is to 5. Question 10. Mary travels to work by train every day. The probability that her train will be late on any day is 0.5. One five. So that means that the probability of her being on time or not late is going to be 0 0.85. So I'm just going to write down that piece of information. So we have being late is 0 0.15. So not being late is the opposite of that. So 1 minus 0 0.15, which is 0 0.85. And we now want to just fill that information onto my uh three diagrams so we have the first one done that's late 0 0.15 late not late is 0 0.85 coming up to fill in then for friday late again is 0 0.15 not late 0 0.85 uh late 0 0.15 not late 0 0.85 now what i would always do here um after i finished my tree diagram I would find out some probabilities here, even though it hasn't asked. But if I was looking for late, late, what I would do there is I'd multiply 0 0.15 by 0 0.15. So that's basically telling me a late and a late. 
and 0.15 by 0.15 is 0 0.0225. The next one here is, uh, is going to be this system here, late followed by not late, and that is 0 0.15 and not late is 0 0.85 and when I multiply, multiply those together I get 0 0.1275. I then come along and I do my next uh, system which is going to be not late followed by late which is 0 0.85 multiplied by 0 0.15 which again is giving me the same answer as above which is 0 0.1275 and my final is going to be not late followed by not late, which is 0.85 by 0.85, which is giving me a probability of happening of 0 0.7225. Now, when I add those together, I should get one because all probabilities must add up to one. So that's part A. And the reason I've done that is that it'll help me now for part B. Part B says work out the probability that her train will be late on at least one morning. At least one morning means that it could be late one of the mornings or it could be late both of the mornings. So the possible outcomes I could have there would be uh, I could have late on a Thursday, not late on a Friday. Not late on a Thursday, but late on a Friday. Or I could have late on a Thursday, also late on a Friday. And I know these probabilities now. I have found them over here on my right hand side. So late, uh, not late is this one. And that's my 0 0.1275. That's the same then for not late followed by late. They're the same, which is giving me 0 0.1275. And my final one then is going to be a uh, late followed by late, which I've already found as well, which is here, which is 0 0.0225. And I want to add those three together, which is giving me a total probability of 0 0.2775. So the probability of being at least late on one of the two days is 27.75% or 0 0.2775 as a decimal. Moving on to question 11. 11a, the grouped frequency table gives information about the times and minutes that 80 office workers take to get to work. In part a, complete the cumulative frequency table. So basically what we're doing here is we're adding them. So from zero to 20, uh, minutes is still going to remain as five uh, workers. Now I want to look at from zero minutes to 40 minutes. Well, that's going to be adding five and 30 because that's going to be between zero and 40, which is 35. The next part of the question wants from zero to 60 minutes, which is these three put together, which is a total of 55. I'm now looking at zero minutes up to 80. So I need to add in these 15 now, which is bringing me to 70. From zero to 100, I need to add in this eight, which brings me to 78. And finally, from zero minutes up to 120 minutes, I need to add in this two, which brings me to a total of 80 minutes. Now looking at part B. So going from my table in part A, I have zero to zero. I then have 20 to, uh, to five. My next one is 40 to 35. And then I filled in the rest. So 60 to 55, 80 to 70, 100 to 78 and 120 to 80. Then I'm going to connect the dots with a freehand curve. And that's our cumulative frequency graph. Looking at part C. And just before we leave this question. Um... Part C, use your graph to find an estimate for the percentage of these office workers who take more than 90 minutes to get to work. So I'm going to come across to 90 on my x-axis, so t for time, 
and I'm going to draw a dotted line up until it hits my curve. And then I'm going to bring that dotted line across then to where it hits the uh, Y axis on my frequency. And again, your graph is probably a lot more exact because you can use a ruler and it's bringing me to about uh, 74. So the question then wants us to turn that into a percentage. So if I'm at 74, how many people were greater than 74? Well, I have to go up to 80. So first thing I'm going to do is go 80 minus 74, which brings me to six. And I'm putting that over the total, which is 80. And then I'm going to multiply that by 100 over one to turn it into a percentage. I'm getting 7.5%. Okay, so having a look now at question 12. Question 12. OAB is the sector of a circle with the center O and radius seven centimeters. The area of the sector is 40 centimeters squared. Calculate the perimeter of the sector. Give your answer to three significant figures. So we're looking here at the area of a sector and we need to first of all write down the formula for area of a sector and the area formula is given as theta or angle over 360 uh, multiplied by pi r squared. That's the formula. We know that the area is 40 centimeters, so we're gonna put in our 40 for A. Angle, we need to find, so that's the key here. We need to find the size of our angle within the sector. And I'm gonna multiply that by pi, symbol on my calculator, multiplied by the radius, which is from my diagram, seven. When I multiply seven squared, I get 49. So 40 is equal to angle over 360 times 49 pi or pi 49, whatever way you want to write it. Next thing I'm going to do is, I'm now gonna multiply angle over 360 multiplied by 49 over pi. That's the same as putting 49 pi over one. We want to multiply fractions, which means top by top and bottom by bottom. So that's leaving me with 40 is equal to 49 pi multiplied by theta is 49 pi theta all over 360 by one, which is 361. I'm then going to put my 40 over one, make it a fraction. When I have two fractions equal to each other to simplify, the simplest way is to do cross multiplication. So 40, multiplied by 360 is giving me 14,400 is equal to one multiplied by 49 pi theta, which is 49 pi theta. Running out of space there, so I'm just gonna bring it up here. So that's one four four zero zero is equal to 49 pi theta. I want to find the size of the angle. That's what we're trying to achieve here. So to get the side of the angle, I'm gonna divide both sides by 49 pi, which is giving me 14,400 all over 49 pi. When I type that into my calculator, uh, it's coming up as 93.5 degrees. So that's the size of the angle in this, semi, or this uh, sector. So my angle here is 93.5 degrees. The question though, wants us to find the perimeter of the sector. So the formula for perimeter is the circumference of the circle, which is angle over 360 multiplied by two pi r. And I'm just gonna fill everything in. My angle theta is 93.5 over 360 degrees, multiplied by two, multiplied by pi, multiplied by or again from my diagram is seven. When I multiply that all out on my calculator, I'm getting the curved part of the shape. So I'm just gonna highlight in, in aqua. This part has a perimeter of 11.42857. So that's that aqua blue part there. But what I also have to do is I also need to add on my two radii lengths, this length here in green, this, or sorry, yellow, this seven and this seven here. So I need to add to that plus seven by two, because I have two of them actually, which is 14. So my answer 
is going to be 11.412857 plus 14, which is giving me a total perimeter of 25.42857. The question wants it to three significant figures, so therefore my answer is 25.4. 25.4 centimeters is the full perimeter of that sector. So question 13, show that the following simplifies to AX minus B over CX minus D. First thing I'm going to do is, you can see with inside the square bracket, I have a quadratic equation. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify that quadratic equation. So I'm going to keep it as six plus X plus five, divided by a quadratic equation over x minus 1. Now we're going to factorize that quadratic on the top. So if I factorize that, I have two brackets, and I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 10, but those two numbers must add to positive 3. So they must be um, positive 5 and negative 2. So negative 2 multiplied by 5 is minus 10, and 5 take away 2 is positive 3. And I put back in my two x's, and I close my square bracket. Now I'm going to look at how do I divide fractions. I divide fractions by flipping the second and turning the operation into multiplication. So I'm turning that division into multiply and then flipping the fraction. So it's now going to give me x minus one on top and it's giving me x plus five, x negative two on the denominator, close the square bracket. I'm then going to multiply these together, so I'm going to put that x plus 5 over 1 to make it a fraction, and then to multiply fractions, we multiply top by top and bottom by bottom. So that's giving me 6 plus square bracket uh, x plus 5 multiplied by x minus 1. I'm not actually going to multiply them by each other, I'm just going to stick them together without the multiply sign, and then I multiply 1 by x plus 5 x minus 2. You can see now that I have an x plus 5 and an x plus 5 on top. They'll divide into each other evenly. So that's leaving me with 6 plus square bracket x minus 1 over x minus 2. Now from now on, I don't actually need that square bracket. So that's the same as 6 plus uh, x minus 1 over x minus 2. I have a whole number plus a fraction. So I'm going to turn that whole number into a fraction by putting it over 1 and then I'm adding fractions and in order to add fractions I need a common denominator and a common denominator is found by multiplying the denominators so 1 multiplied by x minus 2 so my common denominator is x minus 2. So now I'm going to rewrite my two fractions over my common denominator so it's 6 over and then it's going to be plus um, x minus 2 or sorry, x minus 1 over x minus 2. So now with this first fraction, I need it to be over x minus 2, so I need to multiply the denominator by x minus 2, and if I do that to the bottom of the fraction, in order to keep it equivalent, I must multiply the top by x minus 2. So now I have both my fractions over my common denominator. So what I'm going to do now is add those fractions into a single fraction. So that gives me 6 bracket x minus 2, plus x minus 1, all over common denominator x minus 2. I'm going to multiply in that top line, that 6, I'm going to multiply in the bracket, which is giving me 6x minus 12 plus x negative 1, all over common denominator. A little bit of tidying up now will give me 6x plus x, which is 7x, minus 12, take away 1 is negative 13, all over x minus 2. And that's as much as I can do. That's question 13. Moving now to question 14. Question 14 is saying a car moves from rest. The graph gives information about the speed, v meters per second, of the car t seconds after it started to move. Part A, part 1, calculate an estimate of the gradient of the graph at t equals 15. So the first thing we need to do is put a point when t is 15. So I'm going to 15 and I'm going to bring it up to my, my curve and I'm going to put a dot right there. 
Next thing I'm going to do with my ruler is I'm going to draw a tangent to that point. Now a tangent is a line, a straight line with my ruler, which touches that point exactly once. So make sure and be as accurate as you can that when you're drawing the line that it doesn't cross over the, uh, over the curve. So that's my tangent and hopefully you can see that it doesn't cross over the curve. Next thing I'm going to do now is make a triangle from that red line. So when you're forming your triangle, try and make the largest triangle you can to be as accurate. Okay, so from my triangle now, I'm going to count the amount of boxes that I've gone up and across. So this is like your rise over run. So I'm getting basically the slope of this red line. So counting the boxes, counting the rise, the number of boxes going up on the speed axis. So I'm counting about 18 boxes. And on my run, I'm counting 25 seconds. So using my formula for slope, I can use my rise over run, which is giving me 18 over 25. Dividing 18 by 25 is giving me 0 0.72. So if you look at the marking scheme, there always will be a tolerance there um, allowing you this sort of buffer zone. So I'd say within the marking scheme there, they're going to give you somewhere between 0 0.7 and up to uh, 1. So I would say um, everyone's graph is going to be slightly different, so it's not going to be the same. Part 2, describe what your answer in part 1 represents. Well, as I said, it represents the slope, or in other words, it re it's representing the rate of change of speed. So rate of change of speed of this object or car, whatever it is. Another word for rate of change of speed is acceleration. Or it is also known as the increase in speed. Just make sure though, you make sure and mention an increase in speed over time. And our time in this case, I think is seconds, isn't it? Yeah. So any one of those uh, should uh, suffice for part two. Looking at part three now to this question. So it's saying to work out an estimate for the distance the car traveled in the first 20 seconds of its journey. So let's first of all find out where is this first 20 seconds of its journey. So I'm just going to draw a line where t is 20 seconds. So that's the line you can see there in green that I've drawn uh, at t is equal to 20. It wants us to use four strips. So what I'm gonna do now is connect um, 15 seconds to the graph, 10 seconds to the graph, five seconds to the graph, and zero to the graph. So that's giving me my four bands or my four strips. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is I'm gonna label those bands. So I have my first strip, I'm gonna call it as one, area one, area two, area three, and area four, just to help me uh, find the areas a little bit easier. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the area of each of those uh, shapes. So looking at the first one, it, well, to me it looks like it is a triangle as best as, as we can make out. So the area of a triangle is half the base by the perpendicular height. The perpendicular of height of that uh, triangle looks to be going up to about, um, what would we say? I'd say about four, is it? So we'll say um, our height is four, my base is five, multiplying that by half, which is giving me uh, 10. So the area of the first one is 10. Um, what are we talking about? A distance, so that's 10 uh, meters. I'm then gonna look at area two. So we have to do an average height here. So I'm gonna look at basically uh, length by width here because it's not a triangle and I'm going to take my uh, heights to be an average. So the first height we said is about four uh, in height, and then the second green bar is bringing me up to about, what's that, maybe 12 and a half minus one, so about 11 and a half maybe, we we'll call it 11. So plus 11, and I'm going to divide that by two to get the average of the heights, and then I'm multiplying it by five in width. So that's 37.5 meters. I'm now going to look at the area of shape three. 
Again, I'm going to get an average height, so it's length by width. Average height, we said the first height there looks to be going to about 11. And the second bar is bringing me about here. And that's bringing me up to 17 and a half. So I'm going to take 17 and a half for my second. So 11 plus 17.5, divide that by 2 to get the average. And then I'm going to multiply it by the width of 5. So I'm getting 71.25. Moving on to area 4 now. So I'm looking at a first height of 17.5. That's the same as the one we used. Plus my final height here. And that height is bringing me to about 20. Divide that by 2. And then I'll multiply it by my width of 5. And that's giving me... 93.75 so my final answer here now is to add those together plus 93.75 adding that together and that's giving me a total distance of 212.5 Question 15 make m the subject of the formula f is equal to 3m plus 4 over m minus 1 so first thing I'm going to do is make that f into a fraction. So I'm going to go f over 1 to make it a fraction equals to a fraction. So that's my first step. When I have fractions equal to fractions, I can get common denominators. But the easy way is to cross multiply. So when you have one fraction equals to another fraction, cross multiplication is a quick way of doing it. So that's giving me, uh, it doesn't matter which one goes first. So I'm going to go f multiplied by m minus 1 is equal to 1 multiplied by 3m plus 4. I'm now going to multiply in that f, which is giving me fm minus 1f is equal to, now I'm going to multiply in the 1 into the bracket, which is giving me 3m plus 4. I'm going to bring m's to the left and f's and numbers to the right, so I'm going to subtract 3m from both sides, so that gives me fm minus 3m is equal to positive 4 and I'm going to add 1f to the left so I must add 1f to the right. So that's giving me fm minus 3m is equal to 4 plus 1f. I'm going to factorize out the m here from the fm minus 3m so that gives me m bracket f take 3 is equal to 4 plus 1f. I want to isolate the m on its own, so I'm going to go m is equal to, and I'm dividing both sides now by um, f minus 3. So if I divide both sides by f minus 3, that leaves me with m is equal to 4 plus 1f over f minus 3. Now it doesn't matter on your order there, it can be 1f plus 4, uh, or on the bottom you could also have minus 3 plus f. But that is the solution then to question 15. So our answer there is 4 plus 1f over f minus 3. Question 16. The straight line L has the equation 3y is equal to 4x plus 7. The point A has coordinates 3 minus 5. Find an equation of the straight line that is perpendicular to L that passes through A. So we know that a perpendicular line is one which goes at a 90 degree angle. So that's what we know. So if I have, say, let's label this line L here. So the equation of the line L is 3y is equal to 4x plus 7. So the thing, first thing I'm going to do now is find the slope of the line L. So to do that, you need to write it in the form y is equal to mx plus c. So all I have to do here is divide across by 3. So I'm going to divide all terms in my equation by 3 and that will give me y is equal to 4 over 3x plus 7 over 3. So the slope of the line L can be written as 4 over uh, 3. So I'm just going to write that in beside my line L. Now we know that the slope of a line perpendicular to that is when you get 
the slope and you flip it and you change the sign in front of it. So I had my slope, which is four over three. So my perpendicular slope to the line L is going to be negative at three over four. So that's my perpendicular slope. And again, I'll just mark that onto my diagram. Minus three over four. So now I need to form the equation of the straight line passing through the point A and has a slope of minus three over four. So my equation of the line formula is y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1. The slope which I'm going to input is going to be minus three over four. And my coordinate is going to be the point A. So my point A is three negative five. So I'm going to call that X1 and Y1. So I'm inputting three for X1 and minus five for Y1. Just be careful, the formula also has a minus in it. So it's Y minus minus five is equal to negative three over four X minus three. The two negatives will give me a plus. So that can now be written as Y plus five is equal to negative three over four times x minus three. I'm going to multiply across by four to get rid of the fraction. Quick way of doing it basically is you're multiplying the other side of the equals by that four. So that's just a little trick way of doing it, but you're multiplying across by four. So that gives you uh, four y uh, plus 20 is equal to minus three times x minus three. I'm going to multiply in that negative three now. And that is going to give me four y plus 20 is equal to minus three x plus nine because minus by minus gives me plus. I'm going to uh, subtract 20 from both sides. So that gives me four y is equal to negative three x plus nine minus 20, which is four y is equal to minus three x minus 11. Uh, let's write it in the form y is equal to mx plus c. So I'm going to divide across by four. So four y over four is equal to minus three over four x minus 11 over four. So that's giving me y is equal to minus three x over four minus 11 over four. And that's my equation of the line, which is perpendicular to L passing through A. Question 17, there are some small cubes and some large cubes in a bag. The cubes are red or the cubes are yellow. The ratio of the number of small cubes to the number of large cubes is four is to seven. So I'm just gonna write down uh, S for small and L for large and I have four is to seven here. The next line states the ratio of the number of red cubes to the number of yellow cubes is three is to five. Now our knowledge of ratios tells me that in order to get the total number of parts, I add them together. So the four and the seven gives me 11, the three and the five gives me eight. So part eight, question 17 says, explain why the least number, uh, possible number of cubes in the bag is 88. So what we're looking at here is basically finding the lowest common multiples. We're looking for a number basically that both eight and 11 can divide into. Uh, so the number that 8 and 11 divides into, so if I do my lowest common multiple, is going to be 88. So in other words, we're basically finding out that there's no smaller mu multiple of 8 and 11. So there's no smaller multiple of 8 and 11. So I think we've stated enough information there. They'll be basically just looking for you to understand your, to have some knowledge of lowest common multiples. Part B, all the small cubes are yellow. Work out the least possible number of large yellow cubes in the bag. So how is this going to look? So let's write down what we know again. So we have our small is to large and I have that to be four is to seven. I have my red is to yellow and I have three is to five. So I'm just going to extend these now using the information that I now have 88 cubes in the bag. So here, uh, four and seven is 11. 
So to get to 88, I needed to multiply here by an eight. So this is just my little bit of rough work here. So my new ratios uh, is going to be uh, eight by four, which is 32, small in the bag, and eight by seven is 56. So I know I have 56 uh, large cubes in the bag. Coming down to yellow and red, Again, my lowest common multiple is 88, so 8 divided into 88 11 times. So my multiple here is multiplying by 11. So 11 by 3 gives me 33 red cubes in the bag, and 11 by 5 is 55 uh, yellow cubes in the bag. So that's all the information I have. Let's focus on a little bit more though. So the question is saying all of the small cubes are yellow. So that's telling me all of these 32 cubes are yellow. But if we come down to the next line, it tells us that in total we have 56 yellows. So I know that I have 50 or sorry, 55 yellows in the bag. 32 of them are small. So when I take away 32 from 55, I get uh, 23. So that's telling me that those 23 yellows must be large. So there's 23 large yellow cubes in the bag. Because again, we have a total of 55 cubes, 32 of them are small, so the remainders must be large. Question 18, the points A, B, C, D lie on a circle. C, D, E is a straight line. Further information we have here is BA is equal to BD, uh, CB is equal to CD, and the angle ABD is 40 degrees. Work out the size of the angle ADE. So basically, we are trying to find the size of this angle in here marked in green. So that's what we're trying to find, the size of that green angle. Let's write in some information on the diagram that we know. So in this triangle here, we know that all angles must add up to 180. Now it's telling us though that it is an isosceles triangle because two sides are equal in length. So that means that these angles opposite must be equal in size. So angle A and angle D must be equal in size here. So the question does say you must give reasons for each stage of your working. So let's start off by doing that. So I'm examining a triangle uh, A, B, D first of all. And I'm going to go 180 degrees, subtract 40 degrees, which gives me 140 degrees. And I'm dividing by two to get angle A and angle D to be 70 degrees because it is an isosceles triangle. So that's what I can conclude there. So I'm just gonna mark that on my diagram now. So I now have a 70 degrees here and a 70 degrees here. Next thing I'm going to focus in on is the cyclic quadrilateral. A quadrilateral is just a four-sided shape and cyclic meaning it's in a circle. So I'm looking at this shape here, A to B to C to D and back to A. What I know about cyclic quadrilaterals is that the angles across from each other must add up to 180 degrees. So that's what I'm focusing in on now. So let's state that. So uh, I have A B, C, D is a cyclic quadrilateral. So I know that angle A plus angle C must add up to 180 degrees. So therefore, uh, angle A is 70 degrees. We know that. So I'm going to write in, I have 70 degrees plus angle C is equal to 180 degrees. So that means then that angle C is going to be 110 degrees. So let's mark that onto my diagram. So I'm just going to get rid of my information from my cyclic and I'm going to mark in 110 degrees here. My next step now is to fill in these two angles in yellow. So I need to find the size of those angles. So I'm looking at the triangle now uh, B, C, D. So that triangle B, C, D must add up to 180 degrees. And once again, I know one of the angles, it's 110, that's the angle C. So I'm going to take away 110, 
that leaves me with 70 degrees. Divide by 2 gives me 35 degrees because once again, it is an isosceles triangle. Um, and we know it's isosceles because the diagram tells us uh, the two sides are equal in length. So I'm going to mark in my two angles as 35 degrees. So 35 and 35. Now my final step to get the angle ADE, all we have to do now is focus in on these three angles together. They're on that straight line. All angles on a straight line must add up to 180. So what I'm going to do is add 70, 35 and take away from 180. So that's my final step now. So I'm looking, as I say, on a straight line. And they must add to 180 and I'm subtracting the two angles that I, I know. And they are 70 plus 35 degrees. So that's 180 minus 105 degrees. So therefore, the angle um, ADE is 180 minus 105, which is 75 degrees. Question 19. The diagram shows a triangular prism. The base ABCD of the prism is a square of side lengths 15. Angle ABE and angle CBE are right angles. Angle EAB is equal to 35 degrees. M is a point on DA such that DM is to MA. So let's focus in on that part first of all. So a little bit of rough work out here. So I have um, DM is to MA. And that's in the ratio 2 is to 3. Now when I add 2 plus 3, I get 5. So there's 5 parts to it. The length of DA is 15 centimeters. So if I divide 15 centimeters by 5, I get 3 centimeters. So one part is 3 centimeters. So that means to get DM, I go 2 multiplied by 3, which is 6 centimeters. And to get the length of MA, I'm multiplying 3 by 3 centimeters, which is 9 centimeters. So marking them onto my diagram here, I have D to A, or sorry, D to M. So let's mark that in about here. There's M, that's 6 centimeters. And from M to A as 9 centimeters. So that's the first thing I've done. Then tells us, calculate the size of the angle between EM and the base of the prism. So let's connect E to M with a line with our ruler. And I have then a line from the base M to the corner B. And what I know is I also have my EB. So there's my triangle. And we're focusing in on that triangle. So that's basically the key to this question. So I'm looking at this triangle now throughout this question, E to B across the base to M. And I have a 90 degree angle here on the base. And that's as much as I know. So we're trying to find this angle, let's call it theta. So calculate the size of the angle, which we've marked, and give your answer to correct one decimal place. So a lot of, we need a lot of information here. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna focus in on this length E to B. Let's find the length of this line E to B for a couple of minutes. So if I come up to my original picture, I'm going to focus in on finding this length, E to B. Now, in order to do that, I'm going to focus in on the triangle E to B to A and back to B. So I'm looking at this uh, triangle at the end of the shape. So if I draw that out, I'm looking at A to B to E. And I know that the angle is 35 degrees. And I'm trying to get the length from E to B. So this length here. I know that the base of it is 15 centimeters. So a lot of this question is going to use our rules. Again, I'll just write them out to the side here. Our trigonometric rules. So our trigonometric ratios are, I have them as silly old Harry, caught a herring, trawling off America. So we all have our own little rhymes for learning off sine, cos and tan. My diagram here is using opposite and adjacent, which means I'm using tan here. So that means I have tan of 35 degrees is equal to opposite, which is EB over adjacent, which is 15. If I put that tan 35 over one, and I'll do a bit of simple cross multiplication. 
So that gives me then multiplying across by 15, in other words, EB is tan of 35 degrees times 15. And when I multiply tan of 35 degrees by 15, I'm getting 10.503. Uh, so that's the length from E to B. So again, I'm just going to come up to my diagram and mark that in. So it's 10.503. And I'll mark it on my green one, 10.503. So I still don't have enough information. I now need to find one other side of that uh, triangle. And the side that I'm going to focus in on is this line M to B. I'm going to try and find the length of that line M to B. So if I come up to my original picture, M to B is going to be the base length of this here. And in order to get that length, I'm going to focus in on this triangle here, ABM. So I'm going to draw that out. I'm focusing in on the triangle ABM. The angle at A is a 90 degree. So that's my A and coming out to my B and then my M. So getting the distance from M to B, I'm going to use my Pythagoras theorem because I don't have any angles to help me get the length of it. And my Pythagoras theorem is C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared. The C is always the hypotenuse and the other two sides can be my A and my B. Now we know those other two sides. We know the distance from M to A is nine centimeters and we know the distance from B to A as 15 centimeters. So in order to get the distance, so from M to B, it's going to be A, which is nine squared plus 15 squared, which is giving me 81 for nine squared and 15 fifteens is 225. That's equal to MB squared. So that means MB then is going to be the square root of the addition of 81 and 225, which is 306. So MB is going to be a distance of 17.493 when I do it out on the calculator. So bringing that back over to my diagram, M to B is 17.493 centimeters. I think we have enough information there now to help us find the length of the line from M to E. Again, that's what we're trying to achieve, E to M or M to E. So Looking at that triangle now, I have, again, information. I have my opposite and I have my adjacent. So in this triangle, once again, I'm going to be using uh, my tan formula. So that's going to give me tan of the angle is equal to opposite over adjacent, which is tan of theta is equal to 10.503 over 17.493. To get theta on its own, I'm using the tan inverse of 10.503 divided by 17.493. Now again, you didn't always have to work the decimals, you could have kept them in their original form. And when I, when I go to the calculator and type in the tan inverse of that, I'm getting theta of 30.98 degrees. The question wants it, give your answer to correct to one decimal point. So that means that the angle, which is, what is our angle? We're looking for the size of the angle between E, M and the base. So that's uh, E, M, B. Let's just put that in here, which is going to be to one decimal point, 31 whole degrees. So that's 31.0 degrees. Question 20, C, D, E, F is a quadrilateral as shown. Uh, the first part of the question, A, express the vector F, E in terms of A and or B, give your answer in its simplest form. So let's just write in the pieces of information that we have here. We have from C to D as A, we have from F to C as A minus B, and we also have D, to E as B. So that's what we have here. Express F to E in the form A and or B. So basically what I'm trying to do here is I'm getting uh, the distance or how far it is from F 
all the way around to E. So I'm starting at F, I'm coming up to C, over to D, down to M, and continuing on to E. So that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm just going to add them together or put them together in one expression. So A minus B for F to C. Then I'm going C to D, which is and A or plus A. Then I'm going from D to E, so plus B. I can then group them. So A plus A is 2A minus B plus B is 0B. So I can have my answer as 2A plus 0B or just 2A. The next part. M is the midpoint of DE. X is a point on FM such that FX to XM is N is to 1. CXE is a straight line. Work out the value of N. 